So I did some reading and some research and uh, came up with these essays on six of the founding fathers uh, and uh, how the mental maps shaped their agreements, their disagreements, how they, uh, their ideas of the new nation that they were trying to create and the young republic that they were trying to get through some difficult times. And uh, the result is this book. Join the best in the movement. It's Conservative Conversations with ISI, educating for liberty since 1953. Welcome back. You're listening to Conservative Conversations with Tom Sarouf, and I'm joined today by Michael Barone. Michael, welcome to the podcast. Well, it's good to be with you. Uh, I am currently a senior political analyst for the Washington Examiner, uh, formerly with U.S. News and uh, the Washington Post editorial page, the polling firm Peter D. Hart. Uh, For 40 some years, I was the principal co-author and founder of the Almanac of American Politics. So I've been uh, writing about uh, American politics and political life uh, for now, for publication, I guess, going back to college for more than uh, uh, 60 years. Hey there, listener. I wanted to take a quick moment to thank you for listening to Conservative Conversations. This podcast is a production of the Intercollegiate Studies Institute, and our mission here at ISI is educating for liberty. If you'd like to join us in fulfilling our mission, consider helping us by rating and reviewing this podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever you listen to help us reach more listeners like yourself. Now, back to the show. Excellent. Well, it's great to meet you. It's great to be with you and chatting with you. Uh, And I understand that you've got a new book out called The Mental Maps of the Founders, How Geographic Imagination Guided America's Revolutionary Leaders. Well, what's that one about? Well, like many people, I've been reading with great appreciation of wonderful books about uh, the founding fathers that have been published, uh, written, published the last uh, 25 or 30 years by academic historians, by non-academics, splendidly written in many cases, deeply researched uh, and I want to learn more. And my an old friend, the great reporter and Reagan biographer, Lou Cannon, once told me, if you want to really learn about a subject, write a book about it. So I, I thought, well, what can I contribute as a journalist, uh, someone trained who went to law school years ago, uh, but not a professional historian? What can I contribute to it? And I thought the, the, the basic idea I came up with was maps. I mean, we all have mental maps inside our brains, uh, the route that we take to get to the grocery store, the sandwich takeout uh, place that we go to, uh, which expressway interchange we get off the expressway, so forth. Some of us have very detailed mental maps. I'm a guy that's always been very map oriented. I have been to all 435 of the 435 congressional districts, and I can get around pretty well in any one of them. Um, And um, it occurred to me that what I might contribute here is to get an idea of the geographic orientation, the mental maps of some of the founding fathers. So I did some reading and some research and uh, came up with these essays on six of the founding fathers um, and uh, how the mental maps shaped their agreements, their disagreements, how they uh, their ideas of the new nation that they were trying to create and the young republic that they were trying to get through some difficult times. And uh, the result is this book. I mean, it's uh, uh, so uh, it turns out that they had rather different geographic orientations. And um, those turned out to be consequence uh, for people who were starting off, of course, without anything like a geographically complete knowledge of North America. That's a very interesting concept. And I'd be curious to hear more about what sort of research you did for the book. Like when creating a physical, um, creating a mental map for a person, what kind of research goes into that wherein you create the mental map? Well, you obviously want to read a lot about them uh, in various ways, read some of their own words, uh, look through their biographies. I think in each case, uh, I I took special care to look into the early years in their lives because that tends to form our mental maps to a considerable extent. Uh, You probably remember, uh, you know, your first uh, 
neighborhood that you were familiar with living in and how you got to the elementary school or whatever it was. Uh, and so I, I took a look th through these things and I looked at the maps that they had with them. And one of the maps that was important, the one of the maps that George Washington had access to when he was uh, a surveyor for Lord Fairfax and Lord Fairfax's huge land grant that he had gotten uh, approval of in the courts in London uh, of everything between the Rappahannock and Potomac rivers from the Chesapeake Bay to the sources in the Appalachian Mountains. Uh, George Washington was sent out to survey that area in 18, in, at age 17 and 18. And in 1751-52, the House of Burgesses familiar with his experience in crossing the Blue Ridge, crossing the Apple Allegheny Mountain, um, sent him out there to warn, the, on behalf of the British Crown, to warn the French not to try to occupy the land at the forks of the Ohio, that is where the Allegheny and Monongahela rivers come together to form the Ohio River, which is the center of modern Pittsburgh, of course. Uh, and so Washington goes over the mountains. The map that he had, uh, which is uh, pitifully inadequate for the area west of the mountains, it's fairly good for the Atlantic coast, was done. It was published by two surveyors uh, in 1751 named Joshua Fry and Peter Jefferson. Peter Jefferson was the father of Thomas Jefferson, so um, a little bit of a small world there. Uh, but that, that map, that terrain that George Washington uh, encountered, uh, which was very uh, poorly uh, uh, described by uh, Jefferson and Fry, uh, was the area that uh, was sort of the mental map that he kept with him for the rest of his life, uh, going north by northwest, out the Potomac River, over the mountains, uh, was his vision of, 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 a, of a westward path for the new nation, uh, he attempted to build a canal along it. He surveyed that area. He uh, took that trip multiple times, including part of the British force that was defeated at Braddock's defeat in 1754. Um, he uh, purchased a lot of land in that area. Uh, and so his, his drive was to uh, go over those hills and to see those mountain ridges and to see what came next. He notes at one point in particular that there was an excellent quality of coal around that area. And there's a premonition there of the fact that this was going to become, in many ways, the industrial heartland of America, uh, that we're going to you know, have the steel factory, coal fired steel factories that. Uh, that became the arsenal of democracy for the Civil War, for Abraham Lincoln in the Civil War, and then for the United States and the, its allies again in World War II. So that was the future that I think George Washington was pointing to. Uh, his mental maps uh, were well established in that direction. Gotcha. And uh, who, so Washington would be one person that you studied. Who are the other founders that you studied in the book? Well, I, one of, two of the others that uh, have a dis, uh, decisively different mental maps and uh, it had terrific consequences for public policy, Alexander Hamilton and Thomas Jefferson. Of course, they were George Washington, Secretary of the Treasury and Secretary of State, two, two top appointees in the first in his administration. And Hamilton writes at one point, but if you look at how, if you look at the United States, New England is on your left hand and produces all the shipping and merchants and so forth. They have the trees to chop down and make uh, uh, trees on, to make ships out of. And uh, the South of South, the Carolinas on the South, which produce copper and uh, uh, cotton and other crops and so forth. Um, what are you looking at when New England is on your left? and South Carolina is on your right? And the answer is you're looking at the Atlantic Ocean. You're looking at those invisible sea lanes, the great commerce going all across the world. And if you read Hamilton in his prescient uh, letters to Robert Morris and uh, James Duane, where he talks about how we, when he's a 20 something aide to General Washington and he talks about how we need a national bank and to set up uh, a commercial currency based on national debt uh, and, and circulating currency. Um, 
policies that he puts into effect uh, more than a decade later as Washington's Secretary of the Treasury. This is this is his vision of, of, of his mental map. It goes back really, I think, to when he was growing up uh, in horrible circumstances on the sugar island of St. Croix in the Caribbean. Uh, he, his father deserts the family. His mother dies uh, next to him in bed. The, 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 Guardian commits suicide. Uh, Hamilton is employed by these New York merchants that have an office in St. Croix. And they decide to bamboos to go to New York for medical treatment. They put the 17-year-old Hamilton in charge. Um, and he starts ordering the captains to go to a different place. He collects debts that they've never been able to collect. He makes currency transactions in the multiple currencies that were in use in the Caribbean islands. This was a Danish-owned island in those days. He's speaking multiple languages. He was totally fluent in French as well as English um, and had some command of other languages as well. So Hamilton was acquainted with those sea lanes from the very beginning. And he had a vision of commerce and he wanted the United States to be a commercial nation, to be a nation that uh, got economic growth. Remember, the whole idea of economic growth was a little unusual in the 18th century. These societies had been uh, in situations when you, you know, you look at the data about GDP per capita or something. It's kind of a straight line. It doesn't, it goes up and down a little bit here and there, but it's it's not a growth economy. Um, Hamilton perceives a growth economy and fashions his policies to have a national bank to create a currency that would go out. His policies for the national debt that was intended also to be a source of capital for a capitalist economy and a mercantile economy. Uh, this is this is the foundation of his his thinking, his mental map. Um, he writes, you know, in his uh, in his various reports about. Uh, uh, Hamburg and Amsterdam and uh, Bremen and the other city states, the city states of, of Italy, the commercial enterprises. And he wants uh, North Atlantic ports in the United States to be uh, commercial enterprises like that, which of course did come to pass. Thomas Jefferson, a very different outlook. Uh, the one book that he published, Notes on Virginia, written during the 17, published during the 1780s. Um, he's, he includes at the front of his, uh, a copy slightly updated of uh, his father and Joshua Fry, Peter Jefferson and Joshua Fry's map of 1751 that shows uh, vaguely the diagonal ridges of the Blue Ridge and the Appal Allegheny Mountain uh, and so forth uh, in, not very, uh, in not very much detail, the interior. Um, he writes about a wide bridge. That map also includes parts of what are now Pennsylvania. And of course, Virginia included what is now West Virginia and Kentucky. Uh, the Ohio River Valley is included uh, as far out as the Mississippi River. Uh, he writes about all these things. He goes farther west. He talks about the Missouri River, which in the 1780s wasn't in the United States until Louisiana purchased in 1803. He tells you how far it is from Santa Fe to Mexico City, and he actually gets the mileage pretty close to correct. Um, so he's got this vast westward vision of a wide and fertile land beyond the mountains that could be filled with yeoman farmers, and people who would act in deference to their natural leaders like Thomas Jefferson, I, I think was part of his vision. Uh, but this was part of his vision. Um, the map doesn't include New England. It doesn't include New York City. It doesn't include, uh, includes very little of the coast of Virginia. Uh, Jefferson's Notes on Virginia doesn't mention the coast at all. And so you, you can see from that mental map uh, that it, with Thomas Jefferson hoped for the new republic was quite different from Hamilton. He opposed Hamilton's assumption of debt that we create a national debt. He opposed the National Bank of the United States. He opposed the whole idea of a commercial republic and of uh, encouraging manufacturers and encouraging capitalist development. Um, he wanted the, the yeoman farmer to be uh, his symbol and he, he set out some various some policies to do that um, that turned out to be successful. He had a bill in the Continental Congress to Confederation Congress to 
establish the Northwest Territory uh, as non-slave territory. That is everything west of Pennsylvania, north of the Ohio River. That ultimately got into the bill by the machinations of a whole bunch of other different people. Uh, but he sowed that idea. He's He had the plan for those township grids, square miles with six by six square miles, making up a township with one township reserved for support of education. Well, you can see his work if you get on a cross-country flight on a clear day, uh, anywhere from somewhere on the East Coast, crossing the country over to Orange County, California. You can see those square miles and those townships uh, laid off the way that Thomas Jefferson wanted. So Jefferson and Hamilton both contributed important things to the development of the United States. And those things arose, I think, uh, in large part out of their mental maps. So I tried to give readers a sense of this. And Gordon Wood, one of the uh, great uh, generation of colonial and early republic historians, was kind enough to say that uh, in a blurb for the book that um, no one else has looked at the founders in quite this way and that uh, I've managed to contribute something to a conversation building on the brilliant work of a lot of other people. Yeah, well, it does sound very interesting and original. I've never heard of anything really in this sort of research area. Uh, I, you've touched on already so many of the sort of themes that kind of come to mind when I think of the founders, the early republic. Maybe let me start and ask, Washington's from Virginia, but he never has any political party. He sort of gets lumped in closer to Hamilton in a more sort of federalist or nationalist wing of sort of political thought at the time. But it's really after with John Adams and Thomas Jefferson and Hamilton and uh, James Madison, who really, where parties actually come online. And I'm wondering how these sort of mental maps, if you could dive further, sort of you already touched on it a little bit, how geography and these mental maps come in when we're talking about the creation of political parties in the United States. Well, the political parties come about in the 1790s by the actions of a bunch of men including George Washington, including those, uh, all those that you mentioned, who all of whom hated political parties and thought right. the concept of political parties was awful. They, uh, some of them at least had read Edmund Burke's uh, contemporaneous defense of political parties in Britain uh, when uh, Edmund Burke actually, uh, you know, he, he gave a, he was the MP for Bristol and he voted against the local interests in Bristol and he maintained that he had independent judgment. Well, uh, the people in Bristol didn't vote for him anymore. Uh, he didn't run in Bristol in the next election. He was elected in a pocket borough controlled by his ally, the Marquis of Rockingham. Uh, so uh, Edmund Burke believed in political parties. Uh, the founders generally didn't, but they, they formed them. And I think, you know, out of genuine disagreement about major substantive issues. Uh, I've just been talking about the, the different approaches that Jefferson and Hamilton brought to the questions of trade, of commerce, of finance, um, that were fundamental in the early republic that derived from their different mental maps of uh, the country and what they, how they thought the country should grow. Those were major substantive issues. This wasn't, you know, the, the term that a lot of political journalists use, they're bickering about something. Well, they were arguing about serious things. They weren't bickering out of which one was going to get to play with a toy for the next three minutes. Uh, they were doing, these were serious arguments. The other thing that the founders faced, certainly from 1793 on and presaged before that, was that there was a world war between revolutionary and Napoleonic France on the one hand and royal and mercantile and parliamentary Britain on the other hand. And the founders had different allegiances. Jefferson and Madison were very much anti-British and tended to favor France, though they were frustrated by that sometimes. Uh, Hamilton uh, tended to favor uh, uh, Britain, and uh, although he was uh, attacked for that on occasion. Uh, Washington, trying to evoke a position of neutrality, declares in, uh, I think, 1795 that he is, uh, he wants, he, he, wants a policy of neutrality in this world war. Uh, he doesn't want us to take either sides. He devotes considerable space to uh, that position in his farewell address where he specifically endorses the Neutrality Act. 
mm-hmm. um, and that he had managed to get the Congress to pass. So um, th- those were very serious issues. So we have political parties, we have a mechanism, and um, you know, if you l- listen, when you get a serious issue like that, that's really fundamental. You're going to get something that look like parties. I wrote an earlier book called Our First Revolution, which is a story, which is telling the story of the glorious revolution of 1688-89, primarily in Britain, uh, in England, ultimately Scotland and Ireland, that had important ramifications for the colonies. Um, but the issue in Britain was basically whether you're going to have a Catholic king or not at a time when Europe was relent, rent by religious wars and a Catholic king who was going to abolish uh, basically rule without parliament in a sort of absolutism. And King James II also was, on the, uh, was, was in, in the process of abolishing the colonial legislatures. Um, and that was over, that war was, uh, that issue was very fundamental. So in Britain has elections, three elections, 1679, 1681, which you get the equivalent of political parties. They prepare pamphlets on each side and circulate them in coffee houses. Uh, sounds like the internet, doesn't it? Right. Uh, these are written by different people. Then when William of Orange, the nephew and son-in-law of King James, decides he's going to come over to England with an army of 25,000, he's stadtholder of the Netherlands, uh, he, uh, he prepares pamphlets announcing his intentions and so forth, smuggling them in there and circulating them through coffee houses. So this was political parties that came into existence over some very fundamental and important questions. And that's uh, what the founders had to deal with. Uh, Jefferson, after 1800 and his very narrow election, with a complication that his vice presidential candidate was trying to reverse the order of the ticket, Aaron Burr, um, he tries to get everybody into his own group, but recognizes that he's not successful in doing that. Uh, his party becomes dominant. The Republicans, as they generally call them, some people say that's the genesis of our Democratic Party. I think that our Democratic Party really begins later with Andrew Jackson. Right. But uh, it's, it, 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 you know, this was uh, the parties that grew out of this. I mean, Washington's, Washington's neutrality was also regional. Uh, I think one of the consequences of his geography, he didn't like the Southern way of life very much. Um, you know, he was from Virginia. Virginia seceded from the Union. Uh, his, uh, his, his step-grandson, uh, uh, his daughter married Robert E. Lee and occupied Arlington House across the river from Washington, and then, of course, becomes the commander of the major Confederate army and so forth. Uh, but Washington, uh, Washington's sympathies were otherwise. He takes two presidential tours in his geographical quest to know the colonies better, first in the northern states and then in the southern states. And he very much admires the spirit of enterprise, the cleanliness and uh, and, and, and new uh, and progressive uh, the economy of New England and the New York and so forth in those states, uh, the area in New Jersey and uh, New York State and Pennsylvania that he'd occupied with his armies as commander in chief. He doesn't like the South very much. His one journey outside the United States with his consumptive brother Lawrence was to Barbados, a sugar growing 90% slave territory. He hated that. He didn't like, uh, he didn't send troops to fight the British takeover in 1780 of South Carolina. Coastal South Carolina was about 90% slaves. He didn't see that. My, my guess is that he didn't, he saw that as, uh, well, if the British hold on to South Carolina and that doesn't get into our union, maybe that's not so bad. Um, my own view is that Washington looked north. His view was to look to the west, but north by northwest. And that if he had somehow survived the Civil War, if we could do a contrary to a counterfactual like that, he would have been on the north rather than the south. And one proof of that is in the last year of his life in 1799, he sat in that room upstairs in uh, his study in Mount Vernon, and he wrote out with his quill pen a will 
in which he freed all of his slaves and provided right. for their support for the rest of their lives. Um, just as he was aware he was setting precedents when he resigned his command of the Continental Army and when he declined to run for a third term for president, so he's setting precedents in public life. He also set a precedent, I think, in his private life for freeing his slaves, a precedent that unfortunately was not followed by some of the other founders like Thomas Jefferson and James Madison. Right. I'd actually love to delve a little bit deeper into how geography or sort of the northern and southern uh, fractures within the early republic and how, how that plays in with the issue of slavery. Because even though slavery existed in the south and was pretty quickly abolished and either immediately or gradually in most of the northern colonies that then turned into states, basically all of the leading founders in the colonists, whether they held slaves or did not hold slaves, found slavery to be a moral wrong. Uh, but, you know, of course, over time that changes. Uh, and I'm wondering if there's anything in your book or anything in your research about the parties or, uh, or anything else about American history of how geography or these sorts of mental maps and visions for the country based on that play well, in. Well, I think the revolution made a huge difference in attitudes towards slavery. I mean, Benjamin Franklin, born in 1706, grew up in Boston, hightailed it out of Boston as a teenager, went to Philadelphia, spent a year over in London. Uh, Benjamin Franklin owned slaves in his young years. Uh, George Washington, of course, owned slaves, inherited three slaves when his father died when he was 11 years old. Um, the, uh, but they, the, you know, they, this was common practice. But the revolution, I think, by having the colonists assert their cause in the form of an abstract desire for liberty. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, including life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Um, it's pretty hard to square that with slavery. Right. You think about those phrases for a little while, and Thomas Jefferson had such a great capacity for phrase making for you, brilliant use of the language. That was his greatest single skill. And it was on display there. And the attitudes change. Uh, people who in the 1740s and 50s had taken slavery absolutely for granted uh, by the 1780s are taking quite a different view. So in the 1780s, you have the legislatures of Pennsylvania, Connecticut, and Rhode Island providing for gradual abolition of slavery. You have the courts of Massachusetts and New Hampshire providing for the gradual abolition of slavery. You have the Republic of Vermont adopting a constitution which they say no slavery exists here. <laughs> now or forevermore. Uh, you get laggards. New York comes along under Governor John Jay in 17, a gradual abolition of slavery. New Jersey, always a little late, even before the time of uh, uh, Tony Soprano, comes in with the uh, ab gradual abolition of slavery in 1806. Um, so they're abolishing slavery. Even Delaware, which remains a slave state, uh, by 1860 census, 94% of the people of African descent in Delaware are free. They're not slaves. Uh, so there was, a, but there was a definite movement against slavery in the early Republic, which was, you know, uh, which was, I think, prompted by the revolution. It was be hard to call, uh, say that you were risking war, risking charges of treason and the cause of liberty, and still hold slaves. Now, obviously, some people didn't manage it. Slavery became more po po more profitable as uh, in the 19th century with the emergence of the cotton industry uh, and uh, the southern cotton lands, something that the founders certainly did not anticipate. Nobody did. Uh, and uh, you you have element large elements of tragedy, uh, but the view that uh, some people are propagating uh, the 1619 project and the idea that the American Revolution was uh, prompted by people who were trying to maintain slavery uh, is simply not an accurate view, and 
it prompted this significant movement against slavery before the American Revolution. Except for the Quakers, you had very few people in the English-speaking world, very few people in the European world that had a principled uh, view, a principled stand against slavery. Afterwards, that's different. Oh, yeah, I agree. And not only the northern states, but all of the southern representatives who voted for the northwest uh was it the Northwest Passage, the um, the Northwest, the Northwest Ordinance, Ordinance. Of 1787. Yeah, they all, says, all of the southern states agreed. All of the southern states had banned the slave trade. Um, yeah, the 1787, you get uh, slavery is banned west of Pennsylvania, north of the Ohio River. Uh, and they also, of course, uh, in the Constitution provide for, and in Congress absolutely do, ban the uh, sl- international slave trade uh, in 1808, uh, the first year that it the first day that it's permitted to ban, Congress permitted to ban it by the Constitution. Right. Well, actually, so thinking about the Northwest Ordinance, that, that kind of maybe, maybe segues us into thinking about westward expansion, the gradual growth of our country from you know sea to shining sea. So do you have any representatives in the book of sort of a Western mental map or a frontier map? Well, Jefferson obviously is thinking about the West. Notes on Virginia when you get to the Missouri River and Santa Fe uh, and so forth, he's thinking about the West and uh, even, you know, is he anticipating the Mexican War and writing about Mexico City? I, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure I'd go that far, but clearly uh, they have an idea. He has an idea of moving West. James Madison, uh, James Madison had a certain, you know, whose major preoccupation was the sort of theoretical foundation for the Constitution, mm-hmm. the idea that in a large geographic republic and a culturally diverse republic, uh, you you would have, if you had a structure of government that had countervailing interests and checks and balances, uh, you could avoid, uh, tend to avoid tyranny, uh, tyranny of the majority that he saw in some of the state legislatures. So Madison has a Madison has a vision beyond that though. He's got a drong knock sud west, the sud vest, as I say. He's he's talking about the Southwest. Uh, Madison is thought of as a theoretical guy, but he was also a person who was uh, quite forceful when he thought that was necessary. One of the things that uh, you know in the 1780s, he's spending a lot of time arguing with John Jay, who was the secretary, sort of the foreign secretary of the. Con- Articles of Confederation Congress uh, about uh, navigation on the Mississippi River. Uh, Jay is saying, well, we don't have to ask the Spanish for a concession on this. The Spain owned the territory west of the river because we're, they're not going to be any people there for 20 years or so. So it's an academic question, right? Madison is saying, oh, no, 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 we've got to get that and so forth. He's cognizant that you've got Virginians going over the mountains in what would become Kentucky. It wasn't separate then. Uh, and he's interested in navigation on there. And as president in 1811, he does something that I think no other president's ever done before, which is uh, basically annexes something to the continental United States, not by treaty, but by military action. West Florida, which consisted really of places uh, of uh, what is now the southern tips of uh, Alabama, Mississippi, and the parishes of Louisiana north of Lake Pontchartrain and east of the Mississippi River, the Florida parishes, as they're called. So everything from basically Pensacola west to Baton Rouge, uh, there were American settlers there. And uh, Madison just says, well, look, um, I'm just going to send the troops in. Uh, I think this was covered by the Louisiana Purchase, he says. Basically, nobody else thought that. Mm. Uh, and there wasn't very good evidence for it. He says, I think it's covered by the Louisiana Purchase, and we're going to take it. And, and the United States did. And it is part of the United States to this day. Um, and that was, uh, you know, uh, things might have gone differently if Andrew Jackson had lost the Battle of New Orleans, but that's a whole other subject. So you do have that southwestern thrust there versus Washington, more of a Northwestern thrust. He's trying to open up the Ohio territory. He's trying to open up what was declared by the Northwest Ordinance in 1787 to be non-slave territory. And uh, he's trying to link his Northern Virginia to that. 
What's the significance of the Lewis and Clark expedition out west? Well, that's another answer to your question, isn't it? Uh, the, uh, Jefferson is obviously thinking about, uh, you know, sending people to the Pacific and so forth. The fact is that, um, you know, we had American interest. You have the German immigrant uh, uh, um, William Ast- Astor set up, a, John Jacob Astor set up Astoria on the what is now the mouth of the Columbia River in the state of Oregon as a fur trading post. And, you know, those lands in the Missouri River Valley and going over the border into Ash- what is Washington and Oregon were slave. Those areas were claimed at that. You had various claims. I mean, Spain, Britain. Russia and the United States were all staking claims to that Pacific territory, and we're not exerting them in any effective way. I mean, the Mexican government hardly had any sway over basically an almost entirely unpopulated California. And uh, it's the project really of the founder's sons, the next generation, uh, to establish American uh, hegemony in there. And John Quincy Adams uh, transcontinental treaty with Florida gets Spain to agree that they uh, that they have nothing up above the forty uh, second parallel of the current northern boundary of California, and he, had, he gets an agreement with Russia that they're not going to go below fifty four forty, which is the low southern limit of what is now Alaska, and they have a, a British U S sort of condominium where we agree that we both have claims to. British, what is now British Columbia, Washington, and Oregon, and we're not going to settle them right now. Ultimately settled by President Polk. So that's the work of another generation. But Jefferson definitely is thinking Pacific there. I mean, the curious thing about Jefferson in some ways is his mental maps were mental. He never went west much himself. He skedaddles west when the British troops come to Charlottesville when he's the governor of Virginia in 1780. Um, he hightails it out on his fastest horse. Uh, he was a good horseman, uh, and uh, but he doesn't he, he doesn't get as far west as his father Peter Jefferson, the surveyor plantation owner, did. Uh, and uh, he travels. You know, his one trip to Europe as ambassador to France. They don't call it ambassador, but minister to France. He does do some traveling, but he goes down the Rhine and uh, asc- ascends the highest. Uh, cathedral tower in each town to look around. But you notice he sort of does it from on up high. He goes to Strasbourg, now in France, within some people's lifetime in Germany. Uh, Strasbourg was, the Strasbourg Cathedral Tower was the highest structure and man-made structure in the world at that time. Jefferson goes to the top and looks at the Rhine River, goes right by Strasbourg and so forth. He doesn't mingle much. He was interested in the Palladio's architecture. He had his Quattro Libri books, four books of architecture. When he goes to Italy, he collects some uh, 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 moth. He collects some uh, uh, silk moths. He wants to create a, a silk industry in Virginia. He smuggles them out of Milano. But he doesn't bother to go farther east to the Palladio villas in, uh, to see them in Vicenza and Verona. Uh, and the Veneto. Um, he, he, traveling was kind of rough and unpleasant in those days, and you can't sure. blame Jefferson perhaps for not wanting to go through it, but uh, he takes things to his study. So you go to Monticello today, there are Indian artifacts collected by Lewis and Clark in the front room. There's the memory, at least, of the French wine cellar that he gets from France. There are mementos of his reading and everything, but basically, He's a homebody. He creates one Monticello after another. He builds this house on the top of a mountain in a a state where everybody else had their grand houses on rivers so they could send boats directly to England. He builds them on top of the mountain. There's not enough water. He has slaves carrying the water up the mountain. And it's not a small drive, if you've been, you've probably been there. Uh, It's not a small drive up that mountain. Imagine carrying a whole bunch of water. Uh, in Jefferson, uh, it's impractical. He tears down one house and builds another multiple times. Uh, the house has wonderful rooms for him and rather cramped rooms for the adoring women and other relatives that live with him and guests at Monticello. Uh, 
to slaves that he's got it constructed so the slaves live out of sight of his major rooms. Uh, he's creating uh, his own maps. He's enjoying mental maps. Uh, he's enjoying learning about things that's geographically oriented all over the world, sending Lewis and Clark uh, to, to the Pacific. He would have said sending Lewis. He, he always, Lewis was from Albemarle County. It was from another rich family. Clark was not. So Jefferson always said Lewis was in charge, even though Lewis always treated Clark as an equal. Hmm. Uh, and uh, so that was, you know, he, he, he liked doing that. And as president, he was hugely successful with Congress, even though he seldom appeared in public made almost no public speak as speeches of any kind, was not, as Henry Adams writes, was never seen in any major city. Um, basically uh, dealt with politicians around his grand dinner table with ex-French chef, French wines. Contemporary politics was not allowed to be a subject, but he would perhaps introduce gentle persuasion and he would talk about a million different things, scientific and historic and biological, that he had learned about charming everybody, getting his way at least the first six years of his presidency, uh, but not, uh, uh, not engaging in uh, what we think of as rough and tumble politics. Well, I would love to ask more questions, but unfortunately, Michael, I'm out of time. So I appreciate you coming on. The book is Mental Maps of the Founders, and we will link it in our show notes so people can go buy it and read it. If there's anything else that uh, any other places or any other work that you'd like to plug, where should people, uh, where else should people go? Well, I mean, my columns are in the Washington Examiner, you know, uh, Affairs of the Day, and uh, I uh, had a number of other books, so. I'd be happy if you want to just buy all of them. That would be nice. Perfect. Well, thanks again, Michael. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Conservative Conversations with ISI. If you've enjoyed this episode, be sure to check out our website at isi.org slash resources to see all that we offer our members, including the Intercollegiate Review, Select Modern Age articles, debates, lectures, and of course, this podcast. Thanks again for listening. Don't forget to rate and review, and we will see you next time on Conservative Conversations with ISI.